the US military has developed and put into use some of the most cutting-edge weaponry on the planet. But what about the weapons that don't make the cut? Were they so destructive and evil that not even the US military would dare use them on their worst enemies? These are some of the most insane weapons that even the United States won't go anywhere near. Back in the 90s, the US Army was trying to find a replacement for the M16, the long-standing series of rifles most famously associated with the Vietnam War. Modernized variations of the M16 and other similar designs have been commonplace in the decades since, but approaching the turn of the millennium, the military was seeking to retire the M16 for good through what was known as the Objective Individual Combat Weapon Program. One of the prototypes produced by the OICW program was developed by famous German weapons manufacturer Heckler & Koch. The HK XM29 OICW, often shortened to just XM29, was a combination assault rifle that looked like something straight out of the Halo franchise and in fact likely served as inspiration for the Halo assault rifle. It was designed to be used in various different configurations and fitted with a range of attachments, including top-mounted sights that would feature a computer-assisted sighting system offering thermal vision and night vision capabilities with an integrated laser rangefinder as well as a telescopic sight with a 6x zoom. The other big selling point of the XM29 was that it also was designed to be combined with a semi-automatic smart grenade launcher. This grenade launcher component was capable of firing 20mm high-explosive airburst projectiles. Airburst refers to shells that detonate mid-air once fired, showering a target in shrapnel. These rounds could be pre-programmed to travel selected distances before detonation, which also meant that they could in theory be fired around corners. Given that it had a much flatter trajectory than most grenade launchers, the XM29 suffered from a variety of problems. It also used smaller shells than most other launchers, which led to some referring to the XM29 as a 20mm light cannon or simply an airburst weapon, rather than calling it a grenade launcher. But classification was hardly the only issue posed by the XM29. Trials for the weapon began in 1995, but further production would eventually be cancelled in 2004. The Army stated the gun was too heavy and bulky, hurting the overall effectiveness of firing airburst rounds. Its cancellation led to the Objective Individual Combat Weapon Program being separated into three different smaller steps. Increment 1 was to develop a family of light kinetic energy weapons, Increment 2 would focus on another go at an airburst grenade launcher, and Increment 3 would then see a fresh attempt at reintegrating both components. Weapons like Heckler & Koch's XM-8 were developed to meet the requirements of Increment 1, and another weapon that we'll circle back to in a moment began its development in order to fulfill Increment 2. Only once both are completed will they be combined into Increment 3. The HK XM-29 OICW is far from the only attempt to create a weapon that can be used in various different configurations. Back in the early 60s, the Stoner 63 sought to fill the versatile needs of soldiers on the battlefield. This modular weapon was designed by Eugene Stoner, most famously associated with the development of the Armalite AR-15. The Stoner 63 was intended to use a variety of modular components to be configured as either an assault rifle, a more compact carbine, a top-fed light machine gun, a belt-fed squad automatic weapon, or even mounted on vehicles. The Stoner 63 was first produced in small batches in 1963 and made a positive impression when later that same year they were handed over for evaluation at the Marine Corps Landing Force Development Center in Quantico. Many US Marines handled that weapon and were noted as preferring the weapon's rifle and light machine gun configurations and were impressed by how lightweight the Stoner was, as well as its high ammunition capacity. However, issues with the weapon's ammunition requirements would prevent its more widespread adoption. Eugene Stoner had pushed for the weapon to use 5.56mm rounds, a small caliber but a high-velocity cartridge, which at the time was a newer form of ammunition. Stoner believed that this ammo type would soon gain mainstream military approval and intended for this new modular weapon to be chambered for these rounds. However, in trying to develop a weapon that could remain functional in multiple different setups, this meant that the port pressure requirements for each of the configurations was different. This meant that some ammo types like the 5.56 had very little power behind them when compared to more reliable weapons like the M16. When the impact of this problem on the weapon's reliability became apparent, the US Army deemed it unacceptable for service unless the Stoner 63's design could be improved. The recommended upgrades were made to it 
and the improved Stoner 63A would begin production in 1966. A small number of 63As were rushed into service among Navy SEALs during the Vietnam War. However, given that the Stoner 63A was still designed to be transformed into different configurations, this led to it being too heavy. Some of these, like the machine gun configurations, weighed considerably more than the M16s, and the Stoner was far more complex to operate and required a lot more maintenance. While the design was rejected and the project eventually dropped altogether in 1971, the Navy SEALs did continue to use the commando version of the Stoner 63A as their Mark 32 Mod Zero machine gun until it was phased out in favor of the M249 saw. Most of the remaining Stoner 63s and 63As have since been destroyed. Jumping back to a more recent weapon, remember a moment ago when we mentioned Increment 2 of the Objective Individual Combat Weapon Program? Well, meet the answer to the US Army's need for an airburst grenade launcher, the XM25 Counter Defilade Target Engagement System. Derived from technology used to develop the aforementioned XM29 OICW, the XM25 is designed to fire 25mm airburst grenades that are programmed to explode mid-air or when near a target. It once again uses a laser rangefinder to determine the distance between its wielder and the target, and the user can then manually adjust at what distance the fired grenade will detonate. The XM25 then transmits the distance data to the grenade inside the firing chamber, and once it's been fired it tracks the distance it's traveled based on the number of spiral rotations it's made. This makes the XM25 far more effective than other grenade launchers at hitting targets that take cover, especially those who are behind walls or inside buildings dug into trenches or bunkers or anywhere else that traditional small arms fire can't reach. It also has a maximum range of 700 meters, which is exactly double the maximum range of the M203 grenade launcher. In 2010, during the war in Afghanistan, the XM25 was given to US Army personnel in order for them to conduct field tests of the weapon. Five of the grenade launchers were issued to soldiers of the 101st Airborne Division, who quickly discovered just how effective the XM25 was when it came to neutralizing enemy combatants, especially those using cover to open fire on American troops. Before long, those who had used the XM25 or had seen it in action started to refer to it by the nickname, The Punisher. Over the course of nine different engagements, the XM25 was fired 55 times by two units in different locations. It was used to disrupt two insurgent attacks and destroyed two enemy positions fortified with PKM machine guns as well as four ambush sites. According to reports, during one engagement, an enemy machine gunner was so frightened of the XM25 that he discarded his own weapon and fled. None of the units in possession of XM25 suffered any casualties during their engagements, and a platoon leader even commented that where some engagements normally lasted between 15 and 20 minutes, thanks to the XM25 they were brought to a close in a few short minutes. Some soldiers were so pleased by the XM25 that they used it as their primary weapon instead of carrying a standard issue M4 carbine. So, if they were so effective and even able to perform flawlessly in the field with no maintenance problems, then why wasn't this grenade launcher widely adopted? Well, not everyone was so enamored with the XM25. In March 2013, members of the 75th Ranger Regiment refused to take an XM25 on a raid, owing to the weapon weighing 14 pounds, making it too heavy and cumbersome to use on their mission. They also felt that its low supply of ammunition meant that they couldn't justify removing soldiers' M4A1 carbines in favor of the grenade launcher. That's been the largest point of criticism against the XM25. While it can be used by infantry units to engage enemy combatants behind cover, soldiers need to swap out their usual rifle in order to use the XM25 as their primary weapon. That might sound like an upgrade, but it interferes with many squad battle drills and it reduces a soldier's ability to engage any targets at close range. Those critical of it have also reported that the XM25 is far too heavy for an individual soldier to carry at all times. The average US soldier is typically equipped with an M4 carbine, the primary infantry weapon of the US Armed Forces, along with attachments and ammunition. They have to carry around 16 pounds altogether. Even adding specialized equipment like an M320 grenade launcher and extra ammunition only increased that total to a hefty 38 pounds, but carrying an XM25 with 36 rounds of ammunition is already a 35 pound weight to carry, just the weapon and ammo alone. However, the true end of the road for the XM25 was an incident that took place in February 2013. 
During a live fire training event, one of the XM-25s accidentally exploded and left a soldier with superficial injuries. It turned out that the primer and propellant inside the gun had ignited prematurely, although the explosive round inside the weapon didn't detonate thanks to safety mechanisms. But misfiring and causing injury to a US soldier was not a good look, which led to the Army removing the XM-25 from active service in Afghanistan until improvements could be made to the design. Following a cut to the funding, any further development of the XM-25 was delayed, and it was discovered that the seemingly positive early field tests of the weapon in Afghanistan had actually produced more mixed results than first thought. Between 2010 and 2013, at least three American soldiers received minor injuries as a result of weapon malfunctions. However, it's been suggested by some that those operators were given inadequate training in handling the new grenade launcher, which could have resulted in their injuries. While technically still in testing, the development of the XM-25 has effectively been shuttered over safety concerns. We've talked big guns, what about smaller arms? No, no, we're talking way smaller. Concealed carry might be illegal in some states in the US, but in the early 80s, a weapons designer named Francis J. Warren came up with an idea for a gun that wasn't just concealable but collapsible. Warren worked for Ares Inc., the weapons manufacturer and firearms engineering company started by our old pal Eugene Stoner in 1971. Supposedly concerned over the risk of kidnapping faced by public figures, Warren designed the Ares FMG or the folding machine gun. This unique weapon was intended to fold into a box shape, which could be unfolded and ready to fire in a matter of seconds, allowing for rapid deployment. When folded up, the Ares FMG would have only been just over 10 inches long, around the same size as an old portable radio. This was done to allow the weapon to deliberately mimic the appearance of some older models of commercially available radios, presumably so observers wouldn't know that someone was carrying one of these collapsible weapons until it was too late. The Ares FMG would have been just shy of 20 inches long when unfolded, it would have weighed only 4 pounds and would have been capable of firing at a speed of 650 rounds per minute. While it was initially designed to use a World War II German MP40 magazine before being updated to fit a 20-round Uzi magazine, a 32-round box magazine could also be loaded into the FMG, but this would have prevented it from folding. Sadly for Warren though, his weapon design never entered full production. However, it inspired a Russian copy called the PP-90. Stop giggling in the back, please. This version fired 9mm rounds and was developed by KBP Instrument Design Bureau for special units within the Russian Ministry of Internal Affairs. The PP-90 was nearly identical to the Ares FMG, apart from having a different caliber, magazine type, and the addition of folding iron sights. From one weapon, designed to be as compact as possible, to something far bigger and packing way more of a punch, meet the appropriately named Pancor Jackhammer. Similarly to the XM-29 OICW, this weapon wouldn't look out of place in the arsenal of a character like Master Chief, and in fact it has made numerous video game appearances, including in Fallout 2, Fallout Tactics, Battlefield 2, and Battlefield 3, as well as Counter-Strike Online, to name just a few. But despite seeing a lot of uses in the realm of games, thanks in no small part to its distinctive futuristic design, the Jackhammer's real-world usage has been considerably more limited. Designed in 1984 and patented three years later, the mind behind the Jackhammer was a gunsmith named John A. Anderson, founder of Pancor Industries. Following his first-hand experience of using pump-action shotguns during the Korean War, Anderson believed there was a need for a more efficient type of combat shotgun. One of the biggest drawbacks of a lot of pump-action shotguns is that the cartridges need to be loaded into the weapon's tube one at a time. And although there do exist modern versions that can be fitted with box magazines, the process of loading each individual cartridge one at a time can be awkward and time-consuming, not something you want when enemy soldiers are bearing down on you. In order to create what he felt would be a shotgun that didn't have this problem, Anderson combined the heavy-hitting lethality of 12-gauge shells with the repeating fire of an automatic weapon. Automatic shotguns do exist, but what made the Pancor Jackhammer unique, as well as a little unconventional, was that it essentially ended up becoming a giant gas-operated revolver that could be fired either semi-automatically or entirely automatically, changing between firing modes using a selector switch. The Jackhammer featured a revolving detachable cylinder at the rear of the weapon's body, which contained 10 rounds of 12-gauge ammunition. Adding to the overall science fiction aesthetic of the Jackhammer, its barrel had a distinctly angled muzzle cap, and an angled pistol grip was located on the underside. 
Overall, it weighed a huge 17 pounds and measured in at exactly 31 inches. Anderson created a number of mock-ups of the jackhammer and then later developed a working prototype to serve as a proof of concept. He constructed two additional prototypes that were capable of fully automatic fire and submitted these to the United States military for full destructive testing. It's been reported that there were several foreign governments who had not only expressed their interest in acquiring the jackhammer's design, but there were even countries that had pre-ordered a number of these automatic shotguns once they were ready for delivery. However, Pancor Industries couldn't sell the jackhammer to foreign parties until the United States Department of Defense had thoroughly tested and approved the design. That approval would never come, though. The testing for the jackhammer actually ended up destroying two of the three that had been built. The weapon itself was too large and cumbersome, making it overly heavy and uncomfortable to shoot. The jackhammer also frequently failed to cycle in its automatic mode and it ultimately ended up being rejected. Additionally, the time it took the US military to evaluate this unwieldy shotgun also prevented its sale, contributing to the weapon's demise. Pancor Industries themselves filed for bankruptcy and all their company assets, including the prototypes for the jackhammer, and its initial plans were sold off. Interestingly, despite firing 12-gauge shotgun shells, the Pancor jackhammer had such a high rate of fire, listed at an impressive 240 rounds per minute, that it was classified as a machine gun under the U.S. National Firearms Act of 1934. But speaking of terrifying weapons with a frightening level of repeat fire capabilities brings us neatly into the next entry on the list. The General Dynamics XM307 Advanced Crew Served Weapon – A Fully Automatic Grenade Launcher Yikes! Standing on the wrong end of that would mean ending up scattered across several different places, best to steer clear. Lightweight and built to be either carried and operated by a two-man team or mounted on a vehicle, the XM307 has an effective range of over 2,000 yards, and it fires 25mm grenades. Like the XM29 and the XM25, the explosive airburst rounds fired by this frankly terrifying weapon can be pre-programmed to detonate over a target. So the XM307 can suppress enemy targets, destroy lightly armored vehicles, small boats and helicopters, and of course reduce anyone unlucky enough to be downrange of it to fine red paste. And yet, the project that developed it was cancelled in 2007. So what happened? Well, here's what we do know. The XM307 was created as part of the Objective Crew Served Weapon Project, which was one small facet of the Small Arms Master Plan program. This was an effort by the US Tank Automotive and Armaments Command to produce a weapon that could replace the Browning M2 50 caliber heavy machine gun. These guns are ancient. The Browning 50 caliber or some variation of it has been in active use since as early as 1933. It was designed back in the tail end of World War I, and it has been deployed in a number of major conflicts since, including World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Falklands War, the Soviet-Afghan War, the Gulf War, the Iraq War, and the war in Afghanistan. In fact, not only is the Browning M2 the primary heavy machine gun used by every NATO member country, but the United States Armed Forces has been relying on it for longer than any other firearm. Well, apart from one other, the famous M1911 pistol. This and the M2 were both designed by John Browning. By the early 2000s, the Browning M2 had already been in service for several decades, so the Objective Crew Served Weapon Project sought to replace not only that but also simultaneously swap out the Seiko Mark 19 40mm grenade launcher with one weapon that could do the work of both. The result? The XM307. It was intended to be quickly converted from belt-fed automatic grenade launcher to a 50 caliber heavy machine gun in a matter of minutes. This would allow the crew operating the weapon, either from a fortified position or aboard an ATV, boat, or gunship, to assess the battlefield and modify their XM307 according to their current needs. The weapon itself seemed promising, weighing in at 80 pounds and measuring around 52 inches total. It could fire high explosive grenades that would detonate on impact or after a set time, as well as high explosive anti-tank rounds. Now blasting at a rate of almost 250 explosive rounds per minute, you might rightly be wondering how the XM307 stayed still long enough to not go flying. 
Well, that was all thanks to its main selling point, an attuned recoil system that allowed the weapon itself to control and manage its own recoil. The XM307 could effectively be deployed without the need for a large tripod or heavy sandbags to keep it steady, which was what allowed it to be mounted in a variety of ways, including on vehicles. Much like other airburst grenade launching weaponry, the XM307 could also negate any cover that enemy combatants were using to protect themselves. By firing at an opening in a wall, for example, or over the top of it, the airburst capability could be programmed to detonate after passing through an opening or over a wall. This would naturally kill a target while also reducing the amount of collateral damage caused to the surrounding structure rather than just blasting holes through walls and endangering a building's structural integrity. So if this thing was such a hit, why was the project cancelled? Well, also under development at the same time as the XM307 was a remote-controlled version of the same gun. This variant had the added bonus of being able to be fired from the safe confines of an armored vehicle or a defended structure. This version of the XM307 was intended to be mounted on a new range of armored vehicles that the US military was developing at the time under a program called the Future Combat System. From inside a vehicle's firing station, the XM307 operator could use cameras and rangefinders connected to the weapon to identify and engage targets without needing to put themselves at risk by manually aiming the grenade launcher machine gun hybrid. However, when the prototypes for the remotely operated variant were found to have a low rate of fire, the development of the XM307 was cancelled in 2007, followed shortly after by the cancellation of the Future Combat System program in 2009. But there would be one part of the XM307's development that would carry over to a different project, the 25 by 59 mm grenades that served as its ammunition. As it turns out, another experimental weapon also sought to combine a different type of 50 caliber firearm with a grenade launcher. Meet the Barrett XM109, otherwise known initially as the Objective Sniper Weapon and later referred to as the Anti-Material Payload Rifle. This prototype was part of the famous Barrett M82 M107 line of anti-material sniper rifles. These are weapons designed for use against military structures and hardware, or material targets. We're sure you've had plenty of impressive 360-degree no-scope shots against your fellow gamers with a Barrett in Call of Duty. But surprise, surprise, anti-material rifles are not designed for use against living targets. They do have an exceptionally long range even when compared to designated sniper rifles, although a lot more of the modern tanks and vehicles are armored enough to withstand the high-velocity fire of one. Still, they're considered effective weapons when deployed against lightly armored vehicles, stationary aircraft, missile launchers, radar equipment, unexploded ordnance, and other similar targets. So, what the Barrett XM109 intended to do was combine the long-range, high-velocity, and armor-piercing principles of an anti-material sniper rifle with the explosive force of a grenade launcher. Even though this prototype closely resembled other similar rifles, 46 inches long with an almost 18-inch barrel, the XM109 was chambered to fire 25mm smart grenades. It also came with a skeletal shoulder stock to reduce the overall weight down to 33 pounds. Much like other Barrett anti-material rifles, the XM109 was designed for taking down lightly armored vehicles as well as engaging enemy personnel behind cover at long range. Actually, that might be oversimplifying what it was intended for. Barrett XM109 was designed to destroy anything and everything that stood in a soldier's path, thanks to being loaded with smart grenades as its primary ammunition. The rifle packed considerably more punch than the already mean armor-piercing right hook of an anti-material rifle. A ballistic computer was responsible for programming the smart grenades, which could also feature various warheads to suit different combat scenarios. Devastating as it was, the XM109 was far from perfect. Despite having a vertically slotted break in its muzzle to offset the violent recoil of firing such an enormous projectile, the XM109 still came with one massive drawback. It gave one hell of a kick when fired. Even though it was far more powerful than some of the other anti-material rifles, the combination of a small amount of propellant and those hefty grenade projectiles resulted in a recoil with a force of over 60 pounds, as opposed to 36 on the Barrett M82 rifle. As of 2004, there were known to be as many as 10 prototypes for the Barrett XM109, 
the further development of the weapon being classified as the Anti-Material Rifle Congressional Program back in 2006. Ever since, the goal of the project was to reduce the XM109's considerable recoil, but as of the time of this video, there's been little information on the current status of the weapon. Nobody seems to know if it's been adopted by any army, even the US military, or if the project was just cancelled altogether. Still, it's hardly a comforting thought to know that a long-range grenade-firing anti-material sniper rifle could find its way to a battlefield in the near future. It's not just specialized guns that the US military won't touch or won't get the chance to. There are plenty of airborne weapons of war that are just as out of reach, and that has nothing to do with their altitude. Like this one, for example, the RAH-66 Comanche Stealth Chopper. This would have been the US's attack and reconnaissance helicopter to put any and all others to shame. Born out of an idea from the Cold War for an agile stealthy chopper, the Comanche was near silent thanks to the stealth technology incorporated in its design. Its joint manufacturers, Boeing Helicopters and Sikorsky Aircraft, spent decades researching and developing the perfect stealth chopper. In April 1991, the Boeing Sikorsky design won out against their competitors when they were contracted to create a new light helicopter for the US Army. Their plans for the RAH-66 Comanche incorporated a number of advanced elements, including giving this new helicopter faceted surfaces and coating the exterior of the aircraft in a radar-absorbent coating, an infrared dampening paint, and topping the whole thing off with a composite material rotor blade that would muffle any sound that the copter made during flight. In addition, the Comanche was armed with a 20mm rotary machine gun and internal bays that had the capacity to house either 6 anti-tank missiles or 12 Stinger anti-aircraft missiles. In stealth operations, it would use advanced sensors to perform reconnaissance, and it would designate targets for an AH-64 Apache chopper to make a follow-up attack run. But one of the big problems with a stealth chopper is how low to the ground they have to fly. Far closer compared to a stealth fighter jet that can get away with flying at a much higher altitude. Despite all the stealth features boasted by the RAH-66 Comanche, the Pentagon was not hopeful about its chances of survival against any enemy short-range air defenses, including anti-aircraft guns. Also, at the time, drones were already starting to see a wider adoption for the kind of stealth mission the Comanche was designed for. And if those weren't reason enough to call it quits, the Comanche was also just way too expensive. Its development alone ate through 40% of the US Army's aviation budget. Even though two prototypes were produced in 2004, ultimately the development process had just dragged on for far too long, meaning the helicopter was practically outmoded before it could take off. The project was shelved after Boeing and Sikorsky cost the US nearly $8 billion over the course of its development, as the Army's need for stealth helicopters became a thing of the past. However, there was still a need for scout helicopters. At the time, the US Army had the OH-58 Kiowa Warrior, which could perform reconnaissance and light attack missions, but shortly after the Comanche was cancelled, another new chopper was ready to take up the task. The ARH-70A Arapaho was set to replace the Kiowa. Compared to its predecessor, it had a stronger engine, better weapons, and additional sensors. The Arapaho could be rapidly deployed anywhere around the world, and you could even fit two of them in a C-130H Hercules. The ARH-70A Arapaho's high maneuverability would even have allowed it to hover close to buildings and navigate safely through cities. But it wasn't to be as delays in development and mounting costs eventually meant the Arapaho program would be cancelled in 2008. What? Are stealth choppers not insane enough for you? Ok, well how about an actual laser beam? Yes, believe it or not, the US Air Force did have their very own airborne laser, designated as the YAL-1A. This was a high-energy laser weapon system that was designed to be the ultimate ballistic missile destroyer. Mounted to a modified Boeing 747-400F freighter plane, this aircraft would fly above enemy territory, detecting any enemy ballistic missile launches happening on the ground. If one was launched and then entered its boost phase, the plane would fire three lasers from the YAL-1A turret assembly. The first two of those were intended to track the target before the third high-energy beam zapped through the missile and blew it up mid-flight. However, in testing, the airborne laser had only a very limited range and it needed to spend a long time flying aimlessly around enemy territory in order to actually detect any missile launches. The laser beam program may still one day be revived though, albeit this time with a newer improved laser attached to a high-altitude stealth drone. 
Now check out most insane weapons the US military is actually using today, or watch this video instead.